Later in Matthew 9, that's where we're at now. We see two groups of people. We kind of see one peering in with the with the disciples of John and the Pharisees. They're saying, hey, why aren't Jesus' disciples fasting? What's yeah. going on there? Yeah. Why? I mean, and then Jesus comes back and says, basically, there's a time for that. There's a time for, yeah. <clears throat> for fasting and mourning, and then there's a time for a celebration. Like, you, mm. wouldn't, you wouldn't mourn and fast when you're with the bridegroom, when you're actually there in the wedding ceremony. It talks about this, like, celebratory time. Some people so, are probably sometimes mourning in the crowd. Sure, they wanted to be with that like, girl or that guy or something, right? Or like, why is my son marrying this girl or, oh, you know, yeah, whatever, right? Totally. What? what? <laughs> yeah, there's definitely times. It never happens. No, it yeah. never happens. People don't. But generally people. speaking, yeah, when the You're bride, wedding, you the celebrate. wedding, you celebrate. Right? Totally. Yeah. So here's the thing. So here's the question out of that then. Yeah. Do we do that well? Do we mourn well? Do we, I, like, I, I look around, I think we wouldn't. I mean, even yeah. if we think on uh, what we see just perceived from social media sides of things, when people mourn, when there's big tragedies in the world yeah. and people are mourning it, we almost, there's, there's now become this voice that almost critiques how people are mourning, critiques yeah. how people are supporting. Right. Um, same thing in the Christian circles. I remember even when my dad passed away, it's almost like there's there's becomes this time where people expect you to move on in a certain way, yeah, right? yeah. Like, which Get, is healthy to yeah. move forward and move on from things. I was interviewing Paul Johnson, as I shared a few weeks ago, and he said, you know, after losing his son, everyone wants to start relating to you like, can you get better? Right. Because like it's making me uncomfortable right. to yeah. keep coming back to this. Well, it's right? hard, yeah. And they want you to go back to who you were and you, you never do. Yeah. Um, also, when there's tragedy, I think um, our, our kind of secular world has no story to mourn well. Mm. And so they have to borrow stories from faith or Christianity or whatever because they don't have anything... We're, we're the worst, there's a sociologist who talked about how the Western world is the worst group of people at mourning because we don't have anything to explain the crazy tragedies. So when 9-11 happens or a tsunami kills 250,000 people, mm. the religious settings around the world have spent thousands of years answering the question of meaning in suffering. Right. And secularism hasn't. It, mm. it, it, it's, suffering is the is the enemy and so we want happiness so let's just we can't really answer it so you'll see on social media they'll borrow things right, right? oh i'm praying for you i'm thinking about right. you Sending or whatever good, good feelings yeah and yeah vibes so i don't and, think yeah. we generally mourn well but jesus said yeah when when you're his point is the bridegroom's here so we're not going to fast right now my mm -hmm. disciples are not going to fast when i'm in the house yep. because we're partying this is the kingdom and so right. i think one thing we forget is more happened in the life and ministry of jesus than we give credit mm -hmm. he brought the kingdom Something shifted, something changed. It didn't get put on hold. He brought a new way of being, of restoration and justice and salvation and love and right. compassion that really started when he came and we're continuing that on. Yeah. Now he's gone, his bodily, you know, in the bodily sense he's right. gone. Holy Spirit came and he said that's actually gonna be better because it can be multiple people at one time. So, uh, but we mourn that we don't have the presence of Jesus, his, his personage until we get to heaven. Right. Um, and so we go back to fasting the way that John's disciples were fasting. Yeah. And so there's that sense of brokenness because the kingdom hasn't fully come yet. Right. So Christians are called to live in the tension of we live in a now and not yet kingdom. Yeah. The now is there's a lot happening. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that we're called to. There's right. great things in your life that are going on. Yeah. God's transforming you, killing sin, doing totally. things that without the power of the spirit you wouldn't be able to do. Right. And yet you're going to die. Mm -hmm. Sorry, to tell you. <laughs> you're gonna get sick. You're gonna have disaster yeah. in your life. Tragedy is gonna yeah. hit you. So that's the not yet. Yeah. And so we fast mm. because we enter into the not yet, and we mourn and we say, "Okay, we got to connect with suffering." Yeah. But then we we celebrate right. and we hopefully have joy and delight yeah. in our life. Which I think your your point is: Do we do this well as Christians? Yeah. I don't think we always do it well. As we don't we don't celebrate. We don't party. We should have the best parties. We should right. have the best celebrations. We should have the most joyous people yeah. around, rather than being mopey. Sure. You know, and even you even know, in yeah. fun times, like you said, like it could happen in a wedding where somebody's not excited for what's going on or yeah, whatever. Yeah. But like even in that, the celebration. I don't know if you ever had that where you're on a vacation or something's good or you're in a good moment in life and you're yeah. having trouble really experiencing that joy um, beyond it because of things like like death. I think of my story. When, yep. when I first contemplated death, that was one of the biggest things was uh, the joy was sucked out of my life, right. except when I was actually found Jesus, when he transformed my heart, when I had this hope beyond the grave that completely radicalized the way I thought about yep. things. And then I found joy for the first time really in my life was yep. when I actually knew that, man, like it's like death isn't the ultimate, like the loss of things that yeah. I have here aren't the ultimate, but yeah. that my relationship with Jesus isn't that real joy just started yep. seeping into everything I did. I think that's the, the great practical evangelistic thing about this is he's saying 
the world is going to look in at my disciples and they're going to start deducing things about me and mm. about life and salvation and God. And so it's really important that my disciples have a, have a celebratory life and that people will look in and say, what is different about this person's life? Why do they find that, that Jesus is the ultimate treasure right. above money or fame or a good marriage or kids that are on track? This person, um, aside from all that, in spite of whatever might be going on in their life, they find a treasure in something right. bigger than all this. Yeah. That's the impact that I think we need to have on the world looking in at us. Yeah. yeah. So Absolutely. why don't you guys, as your first question in your community groups, cool. talk about that tension about, yeah, let's not put out a face, let's not pretend. Yeah. Um, let's experience real mourning and pain and loss, but let's show people through that that we have a treasure bigger than this life. And then let's, let's talk about the, 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 the tension of that and then the celebratory life where we show the world that we have a delight and a joy in Jesus uh, beyond anything this world can offer. So talk about that in your groups. So it goes on and it talks about that, uh, the, the new and old wineskin. It talks about the garment, the old garment with a patch tearing that makes the tear worse. Yeah. But it also talks about this, the wineskin, which is where I want to settle. So neither is new wine put in old wineskins. And the reason for that is new wine goes in, it continues to ferment. It's in these old wineskins that are kind of dried out. They, they can't stretch and so they just burst and that's what it talks about going on. And then it goes on and says, if, if it is, the skins burst and the, new, and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed, but the new wine is put in fresh wineskins. And so both are preserved. Is this talking about something where us and our hearts, our posture to receive like God and understand him and to grow in our theology and our understanding and love for God, where do we have, can we have a posture where our hearts are old wineskins, where we don't have room to grow, where we kind of come to a place where we're like, hey, I know everything I need to know about God, about Jesus. Because I think about like the thousands of years people have been studying this since Jesus yeah. left. Yeah. And, and the con different conclusions that have been made, the different courses people take, the tracks that are way offline that are, aren't biblical, ones that are, and people are still, you know, like secondary doctrine that people are trying to work through and figure out and yep. understand. Yep. I mean, can you kind of unpack that a little bit just so we understand it and maybe apply how we might be able to keep our hearts in a place where we're like new wineskins, that we can take the new wine? Yeah, uh, I think that's a good point. I think sometimes people get to a place where they uh, think that there's nothing else to learn. And at that point, it becomes, um, uh, hey, I'm good with what I know and I've kind of arrived. I've yeah. arrived in regard to holiness, godliness. There's nothing new. There's no new wine to kind of bring into my life. Of course, right. the original meaning of what Jesus is talking about is he's bringing, as I talked about on Sunday, he's bringing a new, uh, a new era of salvation history where mm -hmm. he's saying the old ways of relating to God, the old ways of salvation uh, are actually being eclipsed by a new way, which is me, and you can't try to hold on to both, mm -hmm. or you'll actually ruin both. Right. You'll ruin some kind of mechanistic, mm. you know, I'm trying to connect with God through mechanisms and, and, and math equations, and he's saying we've moved on from that, from law to grace, and this relationship that's actually quite a bit harder yeah. than a mechanistic uh, version of religion. Mm. And he's saying, I'm bringing about this new thing, but if you try to do the new thing and hold on to the old thing, you're mm. actually gonna ruin both. Right. The old thing's gonna burden you down, the new thing's gonna feel too, like, too much work. Yeah. Um, so you actually ruin both. You ruin Christianity and you ruin yourself. Mm. And so do we, do we so, so I think that, that's an important part of the original context where he's saying this point in salvation history is coming. Where you're spinning it, which is interesting, is this question of do we ever arrive at a place where we're like, you know, I can't even, my mind, my brain, my soul can't take new information, new right. wine, new ideas about God mm -hmm. uh, because we become kind of old and brittle. Yeah, or it just doesn't our, want yeah. to, right? Yeah, like the Holy Spirit starts working yeah. in your heart too, and you're just like, like, no, 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 I'm, I'm good. Like, I've, yeah. I've worked through this, I'm done. And, and yet he's taking you to new levels. Like, I yeah. even think of like, in, in, in like life with sin, it's like there's always new levels that he brings you to. It's like yeah. there's always stuff to be worked on. And if you're not in a place to actually allow yourself to be worked and stretched and, and flexible totally. in that, then it's going to burst. I mean, the whole thing becomes like you said just too much to, to hold on yeah to so I think our posture has to be man we're always learning we're always reforming you know there's you know the, the reform theology uh, one of the statements of reform theology is reformed and always reforming mm. the sense that I'm always learning new things I'm always open to new experiences 
Yeah. Don't close yourself off. The Holy Spirit might be doing something in your life mm. uh, where you're like, man, I never saw myself going here. I never saw myself, you know, pushing into Jesus in this way. I never right. saw myself having a, a spiritual experience like this. Yeah. And you kept yourself from it because what happens in life is is we get really comfortable. I mean, people, you know, generally people don't like change. Yeah. Church people don't like change. Yeah. Um, you know, even moving into this uh, new office space is interesting because yeah. you see the way that people are adapting or not adapting right. to change, totally. right? Uh, hey, where's my new space? Get me in my office and how's this all gonna work relationally? And, yeah. and we don't know yet. We're like, guys, we just take it fluid. This right. is this is the new wineskins of, you know, organic relationship <laughs> and bumping into skins. each other. And, right. and it's not this set pattern of yeah. I have my, you know. Definitely less the, privacy, right? Yeah, it's just open, yeah. yeah, it's good. So I think finding new ways to relate and do work is is an interesting parable of our faith where we're like, man, we've got this rhythm down. That's what I'm comfortable with. I'm not comfortable with, with a new thing yeah. coming into my a new way of, of experiencing God or whatever. So I would say some of you uh, need to break open a little bit in regard to your thinking about God and say, man, I need to learn more. I need to read more. I need to get, you know, I was talking to someone the other day and they, I said, what's your devotional life like? And they say, well, I, you know, read these emails every day from so-and-so ministry. Yeah. And it's like, no, no, I'm talking about the Bible, man. Right. Like, are you opening up the Bible mm -hmm. and reading it? And he's no, not really. And so what should I do? And I'm like, well, read. I'm reading 1st, 2nd Samuel right now. So go through that. So, okay, good. And now his experiences of God right. and the Bible are opening up. And, and so we need to be open to that. Um, and you know, learning deeper and more and, and being surprised by God at right. some time. Yeah. And then experientially, we need to go, man, maybe... Maybe that experience of, you know, uh, I was talking to Dave Morgan this week and his experience out on the streets of Wally as mm. he ministers to people and prays for people and gets them to pray for him. And yeah. man, what does it look like for me to stretch myself rather than to stay in the comfort and the rhythm of every pattern I've known for the last right. 10 years of my Christian life as I've been busy raising kids and trying to do this. And that. Okay. So letting the new experiences in a sense, new wine skin, you know, new wine, actually enter in and kind of and kind of change you yeah. and allow you to do that. So I think great. I think that'd be a great place to go and talk about how can you guys in your groups um, open yourself up um, to to uh, growth, yeah. new ideas Absolutely. about God and your relationship with Him, biblical ones, not you know crazy no. yeah. stuff. Um, and then experiences. How can you open yourself up to uh, new experiences that God might have for you that right. you've been closed off from because you've been hiding? That's, yeah. yeah, that's really good. When we listen to Jesus respond to these guys, a mm -hmm. lot of times I think um, even like first read, I don't know if you guys have ever felt this where you're just like, I have no idea what he's talking about off the top. You know, you, right. you read you meaning it, when he responds to the guys and he right, says like wine skins and, and bridegrooms right. and, 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 and yeah, all these weird and images. And right, and tears right. and you're just like, what is he like, what's he actually getting at? Because right. I think people want to know like what he means and how they yes. can apply it and how yes. to live in that. So, but here's the thing, on Sundays, you'll yeah. often bring out stuff that, that is like, man, like, well, I wouldn't have seen that, right. you know? Oh, I, I didn't think that was going that angle, but it, it makes a lot of clarity. And then reading again, you're like, now I understand. No, and right. that's, that's, a, that's a great teaching thing. But how can we kind of, how, how do you come to that point where you're able to understand it differently? Mm. How could someone at home, when they're doing the devotions, when they're deciding, I'm gonna read this thing more, yeah. how can they actually understand it? Like practically, really practically, what are some tips that we can <coughs> give people to actually get into? And yeah. Yeah, that's good. The, the Bible, reading the Bible, letting the Bible interpret the Bible, um, getting your mind around, um, recognize. I think one of the most fundamental shifts for me around this was starting to understand Jesus as a byproduct of the early Israel story, the Old Testament story, and understanding that when he's giving images like this, even a bridegroom image, it's from Hosea, it's from the right. Old Testament, and it, it's a, an image of God. God. Yahweh is the bridegroom. Yeah. So when Jesus comes as the bridegrooms among you, if you just read that as a 21st century Canadian, yeah. you just think, okay, he's talking about a bride and a groom, so it must mean Jesus is the bride and the groom, and that's kind of it. Yeah. But if you read it from an Old Testament perspective, because right. Jesus was a Jew, not yeah. a Christian, um, <laughs> you start to recognize he's actually doing a, a layered thing here, mm, yeah. where he's saying Yahweh is among you, and mm. I am him, and, and all that. So I think the first thing is being able to understand the New Testament 
as kind of this product of an Old Testament Israel story, and Jesus as a climax of that story. And that comes as, like out of frequency, like you knowing, you on the spot like, yeah, you're like, okay, this is from Hosea, like I'm connecting the dots. Yeah. So there is something about just being in the Word of God just more than Just being in the scriptures yeah. and letting the scriptural story just wash over you mm. over and over and over again so that you think, you know, so um, my friend Norm Funk has asked me to come and preach at Westside, and we're going to swap pulpits at, at, at some point. Sweet. In uh, he's going to come preach at uh, Village. I'm going to go preach at Westside on the same Sunday. Cool. So the, uh, he, he assigns me this passage, Revelation 9, okay? It's insane. It's, <laughs> it's crazy. It's the craziest passage I've ever read in my life, yeah. okay, bar none. <laughs> Awesome. And uh, so he's like, yeah, read, the, you know, and I'm like, well, you get some Matthew narrative, you know, yeah. walk, Jesus walk on a water or something, and I get Revelation 9. We're talking bottomless pits of smoke, locusts stinging half-dead people. It's crazy <laughs> town, okay? Luck, it's talking. It's, yeah. it's, it's crazy. So... Where do you what, start? Uh, so what one scholar talks about, uh, D.A. Carson talks about the idea that pro there's probably no three verses in the, in the book of Revelation that don't have a direct quotation or an allusion to the Old Testament. Hmm. You, can't, you, can, you can't read two or three verses unless you have immersed yourself in Genesis, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and the book of Exodus, right. and a couple of the other prophets, Daniel, you're gonna be lost in the book of Revelation hmm. because it's all building from this earlier. So my point is, is that you're not gonna understand the New Testament unless you wash in the Old Testament. Yeah. You're not gonna understand Jesus unless you understand the Israel story and what he's trying to do. So I'd say first thing is, um, you, you know, you're asking about how to, what, a resource, the best yeah, resource right. is, is the scriptures to be able to understand, man, this whole thing is a fulfillment of one big story. Right. It's not, you know, Christianity in isolation. Mm -hmm. So that I would in, in, encourage everybody to do. Get into that cool. story. Um, and then, of course, you know, be reading commentaries yeah. on texts if you can. There's online stuff. Yep. Matthew Henry is kind of a classic. You know, whatever. Get online, read some commentaries on these passages mm -hmm. so you understand more and more. But especially if you come into it, you know, C.S. Lewis said, here's what terrifies me. He said, what terrifies me is not the words that people read and they say to themselves, I don't know what that means because mm -hmm. they'll go and they'll pick up a dictionary and they'll figure, figure out what out. it means. Yeah. He said, what terrifies me are the word of the concepts of where people read it and they think they know what it means and they right. don't go look it up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think that's true with the Bible right. often yeah. is like, we think we know what it means. Mm -hmm. We think we know what the bridegroom means or what the wineskins mean or whatever. But if we don't go and study it deeper, you know, and that's, yes. I mean, this is one of the beautiful parts of community, right? I mean, Absolutely. what are we doing this community group thing for? Because this is what uh, Leslie Newbigin talked about, a, a, uh, a hermeneutic that, that is like a communal hermeneutic, mm. meaning as you're interpreting the scriptures, that you're doing it communally. You're yeah. sitting around with one another going, man, the bridegroom is it. And then you're like, yeah, but actually, you know, it's, I was reading Hosea the other day and you're like, what, Hosea, what are you talking about? And there's this like, <laughs> yeah. not a vacuum right. interpretation world, yeah, there's this these, communal yeah, world absolutely. where we can help each other interpret the text. I'm not talking about I think it means, no. I'm not talking about I think it means this and I think it means that and you know, my my uh, new age philosophy teacher said right, that, I'm not right. that, I'm no. talking about rooted scriptural, yep theological interpretation where we're helping draw out things. So I think that's a really important part of this too. So, yeah. yeah, well let's take some time right now and actually use that community that's around you to discuss how you keep on point, how you develop theologically, how you read and understand the Bible, and then help each other kind of do that as we continue. Yeah, and, may and maybe you can look across the table and go, hey, you know, there was that time, Joe, that you helped me when you asked for that prayer request right. about your sister and you framed it this way, you helped me understand God this way better, whatever. Be Actually encourage each other Absolutely. in the room. Say, you helped me with this, you helped me with that. Don't critique, No. all right? Don't, don't say, oh, that, <laughs> dumb, that, that dumb that, thing you said the that. other day. Yeah, no, exactly. think about yeah. encouraging things you can say around the room to one another to say, you really helped me out in this cool. scenario.